Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Ramadan Kareem. Um, although, I'm gonna, I should have, like, injected myself with some kind of... Uh, well, I guess I would be breaking my fast if I injected myself with adrenaline or something. But uh, it's 8.30 in the morning here, so it's not uh, not the most energetic time during Ramadan. But I'll do my best to... Um, stimulate myself mentally uh and i had a um i was originally going to talk about a different topic which would have had better pictures but uh i thought that maybe it wouldn't be very spiritually useful so i changed this one um but of course it doesn't really have a lot of pictures but i i thought i'd at least give you some of the the information i'll be using um uh, in powerpoint so here we go should be it um is that so you're now seeing the um the powerpoint right what are you, what are you, are you guys seeing what the, the the thing i'm showing you okay um all right so uh okay i think that's better yeah, so um, I, I want to talk about the uh, the kind of what uh, the Prophet Muhammad as a um, kind of example of social justice and how that can be useful for us today. Um, of course, the term social justice is kind of uh, um, debated or um, at least in the United States, it's kind of got uh, different connotations. Uh, if you if you google like social justice then one of the first things that comes up is just images of social justice warrior and i just it's like one of the image the first images that came up on the left that was pretty funny right so this idea of um kind of the uh, the whining um activist who is sort of uh always uh, complaining about uh, injustice and is, you know, doesn't really do anything. Um, so, uh, but that's, uh, you know, not what we're going to talk about. But I just thought it was a pretty funny picture. Um, uh, but of course, social justice is, is uh, I mean, as a concept, right, it's a very positive concept. It just means that, um, well, it, what does it mean, right? If you, considering that, you know, American Supreme Court justices will look up the dictionary definitions of stuff when they want to do statutory interpretation. I thought, uh, why not just look at some you know dictionary sources of what this means? So Webster says it's a, a state or doctrine of egalitarianism. Dictionary.com has, quote, the distribution of advantages and disadvantages within society. And um, so you have here, like, uh, kind of two uh, well-known kind of uh, themes that are intention, right? One is notion of egalitarianism, uh, egalitarianism, and uh, which means sort of everybody is equal. And uh, on the other hand, you have this notion of distribution of advantages and disadvantages within society, which doesn't actually say how the distribution is going to occur, because the tension here is um, are things distributed equally? Or are things distributed equitably, right? So, um, equitable, equitable, equitable doesn't mean equal necessarily. Um, you know, if we have a pie, and um, let's say Fatty and I are uh, Fatty and Eunice and I are uh, sitting around, and we have a pie, we say let's divide up the pie. Um, you know, kind of the equal or default thing we would do is divide it up. You know, each of us gets one third, right? But equitable might be different. So let's say I cook the pie, I bought all the ingredients, I um, uh, own the oven, I uh, spent all my time doing it, I, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, the other two guys, they just sort of sat around and watched uh, Ramadan cereal TV while I was doing this. Maybe equitable would be I get half the pie and they each get one fourth of the pie, right? So equitability, equitable means that um, people are getting more based on what they deserve, not necessarily based on equality. But this, 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 this is like a real tension. When anytime we talk about justice, um, what do we mean by justice? Is justice that everybody gets treated equally? Or is justice like what Aristotle said, that everybody gets their desserts? Um, by the way, when you use that word just desserts, we have to remember it doesn't mean the stuff you eat after dinner, like mamul or kenafe or things like that. Um, 
but uh, de- desserts in the sense of what you deserve. So for Aristotle, justice is everybody gets what they gets what they deserve. Um, which is, of course, we see this also in the the um, the hadiths of the Prophet uh, where one of the elements of being just is ita 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 right? So giving everybody who has a haq their haq, this is justice. Um, or as in classical Islamic thought, al adil. So justice is putting everything in its proper place, giving everybody their proper due. Um, I just was thinking about definitions that, uh, that I would come up with for social justice. And it's uh, it was just the fair or just distribution of resources and opportunity within a community. Uh, so the, the kind of when you talk about this idea of justice and community, um, you have two major questions, right? So is this, is this just equity or equality? And then who determines that, right? So who, if, if you say it's, it's equity, who gets to make the decision about um, who gets what, and who deserves what? So if we talk about that pie example, um, if it's me, Fatty, and Eunice about who gets how much, how much of the pie, who gets to make that decision? Obviously, that's a very powerful position. Um, and then second, what are the boundaries of that community? And this is something that's really important. Um, you know, uh, it's always been important, but we can see it, it being very important today. I mean, uh, let's take an example of the uh, the United States. Like, who's in the, who's in the um, who's in the community, right? So, who gets access to justice, to social justice? Who who deserves it? So, if someone is someone if someone's a refugee uh, in a state, do they are they part of the group that's going to get a slice of the pie? Do they have a, um, a right in that equation of justice? If someone is vulnerable, if someone is a disenfranchised minority that's historically oppressed, right? Um, uh, uh, who, who, who's in and who's out, right? So these are uh, really important questions that, that come up when we talk about um, justice and, uh, and within a society. All right. Um, okay. Now, uh, well, first, I mean, uh, let me just go back to um, kind of how the, the what the, the kind of Quran and Sunnah teach us about some of these issues, right? So I think when you look at the, the Sunnah of the Prophet and the example he gives us in, in his life, uh, alayhi um, salam, and this is, these are my, you know, conclusions or my observations, I, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected, uh, I, I might, I'm, you know, I did do the best I can. But um, one is that, you know, what you clearly see is equality of legal rights. So uh, everybody in the province community has access to justice. Everybody has the same legal rights. Um, but there's equity in terms of duty. So not everybody has the same obligations. Not everybody has the same duty. So duty would be determined like equitably, whereas uh, rights are equal. Um, and of course, one of the most famous uh, aspects of this is his, the Prophet his complete uh, rejection of racial discrimination, uh, both in terms of what we think of as like race as skin color, right, phenotype, where he says very famously, you know, la fadl lil Arabi ala al Ajmi wala lil Ajmi ala al Arabi wala lil Ahmar al Aswad wala lil Aswad al 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 as ahmar illa the taqwa right so that the arab has no um superiority over the non-arab the non-arab has no superiority the arab a red skinned by which they mean actually white like me um person versus a black skin and nor a black skin person over a red skinned i.e like me person uh, except in taqwa right so there's a famous hadith in muslim ahmed ibn hanbal that uh you know the only thing that matters in a person is their um their their virtue in the eyes of God. Hang on, hang on. Uh, there's just some sound happening, guys. Uh, don't uh, make too much noise. Sorry, just uh, some kind of drama with kids going on uh, in the background. Um, and then, of course, also the the Prophet's complete rejection of of tribal uh, chauvinism, right? So. Um, the idea that you know just because you belong to a certain tribe uh, you're better or 
belong to a certain, um, and, and that that kind of should be allowed to create, um, strife. And so there's the famous example of like when the prophet Salam, comes out and he hears the Aus, Aus and the Khazraj just started to talk about their historical conflicts with one another and started to kind of get back into some of the nasty d talk around their tribes and their com competition and, and um, conflicts with one another. And the prophet comes out and says, have a muntin, you know, this is filthy. This is, this is disgusting. This is uh, putrid. Uh, this kind of a d discussion. Um, what's also a, a very interesting, right, is um, uh, I think this is really interesting in, in the life of the Prophet, is that uh, there's very little, um, there's there's very little uh, um, distinction in terms of gender. Um, of course, there's, you know, distinction in terms of gender in terms of like there's men and there's women and you know, men, women dress one way, men dress another way, right? Men and women don't just walk in and sit with each other, right? So there's very clear, like, notions of a gender division. There's very clear notions of sexual propriety. But in terms of, um, like, people's capacity, uh, gender is not a huge element there. So uh, women in the Prophet's community feel free to speak up and make their opinions known, Um Oh uh, yeah, of course. Obviously, men are the most of the ones who fight in battle. But we know the example of people like Nusayb bin Taqab, who also fight in the battle of Uhud, and she saves the protects the Prophet when a lot of other people had run away from him, who had run away uh, from the enemy. So um, uh, women actually participating in battle. And there's, I think, this is this second hadith I have up here on the bottom from Sahih Muslim, which I think is really interesting. Um, that uh, the Prophet is, this is from Um Salama, the wife of the Prophet, and he's speaking. And um, uh, uh, she says, "Kuntu asma al nas yath kuruna al hauda, wa lam asma dalik min Rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, fa lam akana yawman min dalik wal jariyatu tam shutani, fa sima'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ayuha nas." فقلت للجارية أستخري عني قالت إنما دعا الرجال ولم يدع ولم يدع النساء فقلت ألا إني من الناس. so the the Abu Salim is saying um, she heard people talking about this on the day of judgment there's going to be this pool this fountain al hold and she hears people discussing it and then she hears the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام speaking about it um, and uh, speaking to the people يا أيها الناس or people and she's she's in the house and the, uh, her servant is like combing her hair and she says you know I, i'm gonna go and and listen and then the servant woman says no he called the men and and, and she says no he said oh people and i'm one of the people but she goes out and listens to him speak um all right um okay another thing that's really important in terms of equity is uh, the people are treated um, equitably in terms of their capacity. So, right, the, the, a very important saying from Aisha, radiallahu uh, ta'ala anha, is she says that, عَلَّمَنَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَنْ نُنَزِلَ أَنَّاسَ مِنَازِلَهُمْ Right, we were, the Prophet taught us, amarna, uh, sorry, amarna, the Prophet commanded us to put people in their proper places, right? So we, to use people for their proper tasks to use people for their proper purposes and to put them in their proper places not in terms of like you know oh you're bad i'm going to put you in your place so, you know but in terms of you you people should fulfill their correct roles in society you know and there's a, a good example of this also in sahih muslim which is the top hadith um uh, uh from uh abu dhar right so abu dhar al-ghifari uh, where the Prophet says, Ya, ya Abu Dhar, inni araka da'ifan, wa inni uhibbu laka ma uhibbu li nafsihi, wa la ta'amaranna ala ithneen, wa la tawalayanna ma la yateeman. Right? This is a really interesting hadith. The Prophet says, um, the Prophet says to Abu Dhar, alayhi wa he says, I love you, and I want for you what I'd want for myself, but I see you're a, you're a weak person. You're not, you know, you're like a very spiritual person. Obviously, he's like a very, he's almost an ascetic, he, especially after the death of the Prophet. 
in the early years of the Muslim community, Abu Dhar goes and basically lives in the desert. He basically becomes like the, one of the first Sufis. Um, so he says, you're, you're a weak person. You're, you're, you're not going to be put in charge of other people. You're not going to be even put in charge of two people, and you're not going to be in charge of the, the wealth of an orphan, because that's not your capacity. That's not your capacity. So it's a very important uh, lesson. Um, and of course, the, the, the fact that the early Muslim community uh, uses people's talents without any concern for their background, uh, without any discrimination. So uh, whether it's uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud or Abu Musa al-Ashari or Mu'adh ibn Jaba or, or Abu Huraira, right? So these people are all basically shepherds or small-scale merchants from Western Arabia. And these are the people who are put in charge of you know, Basra, Kufra, Isfahan, uh, Sana'a in Yemen, right? So they, um, their background doesn't, or Salman al-Farsi, for example, is made the governor of um, Isfahan. He's a former slave, right? And then so many of the, the early scholars, uh, Makhul al-Shami, Nafi'a, Muhammad ibn Sirin, Ikrima, these are all uh, the, the major scholars of the generation of the successors, and then the next generation. Uh, a number of the major scholars are, are not only not Arabs, right, but they're actually, you know, Berbers or Persians. They're actually uh, former slaves. So they were actually in, uh, slaves and they're freed and they become like the leading scholars of the Muslim community. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, um, other, other things... Uh, we see in terms of the prophet and social justice uh, is very famous, um, the kind of the way that he distributes wealth in the Muslim community. Um, of course, there's the idea of zakat, and zakat's uh, very important, right? So uh, it, zakat is, is, the Quran says that there is in there, you know, you, people acknowledge, believers acknowledge that in their, we in their wealth there is haqqun ma'lum. So zakat is not me you know, oh, I'm going to be nice, I'm going to pay my zakat, you know, I'm going to give charity. Uh, zakat, yuzeki, zakat actually ch purifies your money. If you don't give zakat, your money is not halal. Um, well, obviously, if you, this is only if you have above the minimum amount for zakat, right, then you saw. But um, there's a haq ma'loom, so there's a known right, there's a known amount of my money that has to be given in charity if, that, if my wealth overall is going to be pure for me. So you have to pay as a cat. Um, uh, he pairs when the the immigrants come to the Muhajirun, come to Medina, he pairs them with local people, right? So he gives, he's called the Muakha, where he takes um, um, people like uh, Salman al-Farsi and like Abdullah bin Ruwaha, and he puts them together as brothers. And like, so he creates these pairs with sort of a, an immigrant who is not from Medina, and then someone from the local population, so they're kind of bound together, and they're, they're, he creates that relationship um, to, to to like help counteract tribal solidarity, and also to create to, to sort of um, integrate the immigrants into the economic life of the city. Um, and uh, of course, the Quran and the Prophet end exploitative practices like um, riba. So any kind of interest-bearing transaction or usurious transaction are, are ended. And what's very interesting is this is even true. So as we'll discuss in a, in a few minutes, right, the uh, Muslims are very um, liberal with other religious communities. So the, the kind of the default with uh, the Quran and the, and the teachings of the Prophet is is that um, other Muslim, other religious groups are allowed to continue practicing their religion under Muslim rule, um, even if they're doing things that Muslims don't agree with. But one thing they can't do, one thing they cannot do is they cannot charge interest. They can't do interest because that's exploitation. And um, so the, the famous treaty that the Prophet uh, signs with the people of the Christians in Najran, in what's now kind of right on the border between Saudi Arabia and Yemen, uh, he says, you know, you, you're, you, no one's going to uh, uh, touch your bishops and your mo your monks, and you can continue to practice and have your crosses and everything, um, but you can't um, you can't uh, charge riba. You can't charge riba. 
Okay, so um, what are the uh, boundaries of the kind of Muslim community? I think if you think about the community of the Prophet, والسلام, you see, and then I think in general in Islamic civilization, you see that there's a kind of three concentric circles, right? So there's the the first is like the Ummah Ummat al Muslimin, so the community of Muslims, of believers. Um, and then you have the kind of Dar al Islam, which is the the world that is governed by Muslims, but it has significant um, significant non-Muslim uh, population, right? So, I was just seeing the other day that um, that um, Istanbul in the kind of 1880s and 1890s, uh, Istanbul was like um, it was about 50 percent Muslim and non-Muslim. So. The, you know, about 50% of Istanbul was like a Greek and Armenian Christian. And there's also some Jews and other communities. But I mean, so it came to the 1880s and 1890s. And uh, Baghdad, uh, even in the after World War One, Baghdad's about one eighth Jewish population. So the population of Baghdad, in the, even in the early to mid 20th century, was one eighth Jewish. Uh, and of course, cities like uh, Salonika. In what's now Greece, but was in the Ottoman Empire, right? Salonika had uh, was one of the few cities in history that was majority Jewish population um, in the Ottoman Empire. All right. Um, okay, and of course the 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 example that people uh, love to discuss, and I think pr appropriately discuss, right, is the, the constitution, the Sahifat al Medina, right, the con what's called the Constitution of Medina, which is this document that uh, the the inhabitants of Medina come to an agreement on. Uh, of course, um, what's really interesting, right, is that when the Prophet arrives in Medina, والسلام, the majority of the population is not Muslim. I mean, they're, they're not, not only not Muslim, but they're they're actually Jewish or different Jewish tribes. Um, and, uh, and there, there's a, um, it's not actually clear when he does this, but in Sahih Bukhari, there's a, a hadith that talks about at some point in Medina, my guess is it's pretty early, uh, but it, you know, maybe four or five years after the Hijra, but the prophet والسلام, has a census. He basically says that people who've declared themselves Muslim, let's get a list of their names. And there's only about 1,500, so there's only about 1,500 people in Medina that are Muslim at that point. Um, and if you think later on that some of the estimations by like Imam Shafi are that there's like 30,000 people in the kind of greater Medina area um, who are Muslim by the end of the Prophet's life, uh, you can see like how maybe small the Muslim population was originally in Medina. And so basically, it's a, it's a maybe majority non-Muslim and uh, who are coming to this agreement uh, with this the Sahib of Medina, which is very important, right? It's one of the things it says is that there's one ruler, one judge, and that's the Prophet. So um, people, disputes are adjudicated by the Prophet, and he's the ultimate decision maker. Um, and there's this great line in the, the, the Sahifa, right, that يَاثِرُبْ حَرَامٌ جَافُهَا لِأَهْلِ هَذِهِ الصَّحِيفَةِ So, the, the kind of the, the interior of Yathrib is a haram for the people of the Sahib. It is a place, a sanctuary where they're safe. Uh, and very famously, it says they make war together, they make peace together. And um, there's a very uh, stressed over and over again in the Sahib is this notion of justice and help. So uh, mutual aid and mutual justice over and over again, uh, it talks about aid and equity. Um, between the, the the Jews and the polytheists and the Muslims. Um, it, it, ten times, the Sahifa talks about how each of the clans, from the different clans within the Khazraj, the different clans within the Aus, the different Jewish clans, um, they owe, they must according to, they must act according to Al-Qist uh, Wal-Ma'roof. Al-Qist Wal-Ma'roof. Qist is justice and Ma'roof is what is right. Ten times it says this. They must act according to what is just and what is right. Um, and of course, the the Quran orders Muslims, uh, not just at the time of the Prophet, but throughout time, right? Uh, very famous verses. Ya amanu kunu kawamina lillah shuhada'a bil-qist wa la yajramannakum shanna 
وقومن على عن لا تعدلوا right and then also كونوا قوامين بالقسط شهداء لله ولو على أنفسكم والوالدين أو الوالدين والأقربين so you know all you who believe uh, be uh, stand firm by God and be witnesses to justice and let not your dislike for any community for people uh, make you be unjust right uh, Rather, it then continues, right? So be just because this is closer to piety. And then another verse, uh, stand firm by justice and be witnesses for God. And even if it's against your own selves or against your parents or your relatives. So again, um, justice is independent of your kin, of your identity, of who your friends are, who your friends are. Justice is, is, a, is an absolute value. Um, okay. Uh, and and this is, uh, of course, uh, it doesn't matter what religion you belong to, because there's a famous example in Sahih Bukhari, where um, uh, Al Ashraf bin Qais, so one of the Muslims, a very prominent Muslim, is disputing with a Jew in Medina, and uh, over some land, and they come to the Prophet to, to settle the dispute, and Ashraf bin Qais doesn't have any evidence, doesn't have any witnesses, and the uh, the Jewish man brings like witnesses who testify that this property belongs to him. Um, and the Prophet rules on behalf, on the side of um, of the Jewish man, and Ashraf bin Qais is like, alright, how are you taking the side of this unbeliever against me, a fellow Muslim? And the Prophet says, this is how we know who has the haq, is through the bayina, the, the uh, clear evidence. And he has the evidence, and you don't have the evidence. It's very simple. Um, alright, um, Now, uh, just uh, kind of the last circle is the circle of kind of humanity as a whole. And uh, I, I haven't thought a lot about this. It's not my specialization. But, um, you know, we can also think about maybe creation, uh, not just, you know, humanity, but also um, the environment, uh, animals. I mean, what are our obligations regarding those uh, non-human life on this planet? Uh, maybe someone else can give a lecture on that because it's not my specialization. Um, but uh, you, you see this, you know, clearly in the, for example, the Islamic laws of war and conflict, right? So the very famous hadith, Sunnah Ibn Majah, agreed upon by everybody that you know, the Prophet said, "Do not kill." So don't. Kill uh, if you're fighting. You don't kill civilians. You don't kill women. You don't kill children. You don't kill old men. You don't kill monks. So you don't kill non-combatants. Period. Uh, and also, uh, we know from the Prophet's Sira um, when they uh, the Muslims attack Taif that the Prophet Laissez-Salam commands them not to burn any of the trees. Don't uh, destroy uh, any of the date palms. Right. So you don't want to just destroy life, even kind of plant life or agricultural life unnecessarily and then um you, sorry oh says i'm supposed to give a lecture in new york well that's not going to happen i mean i'm supposed to be in new york but i guess i got canceled um and then also uh, there's this oh, a wonderful hadith i mean it talks about just the just a general respect for life for human life as a as a it has a commonality between all, all human beings, right? They're in Sahih Muslim, um, uh, the, the early Muslim Sahib bin Hanif and Qais bin Sa'ad, they're, uh, they're uh, after the Battle of Qadisiyah, which is when the, in a 636, 637, when the Muslims like finally basically completely defeat the Persian Empire, the Sassanid Empire. Uh, and there's this um, funeral for a dead Persian soldier who goes by them, uh, Zoroastrian, right? So Majus. And Sahib bin Hanif and Qais bin Sa'ad stand up, rise as the, the, the body is carried by them. And um, you know, someone says, like, why are you standing up? This person is a Zoroastrian. They're the Majus, they're not Muslim, they're not under Kafir. And they say the Prophet stood when a funeral, a Jewish person was a funeral came by him in Medina. And someone asked him why he stood up. And he said, Alayh said, Nafsan. It's like, it is not a soul, it is not a human soul that you have to respect. And then there's a really interesting um, incident that occurs in the Hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim that uh, during the kind of 
almost decade-long conflict with um, the Quraysh of Mecca uh, between me, me, the Muslims of Medina and, and Meccans. Um, the Prophet prays that God kind of afflict Mecca with hardship. Uh, and um, and then they're, they're afflicted by famine, right? So they have a famine. And Abu Sufyan comes to the Prophet, والسلام, and he says, um, you know, you say that you've come to you call people to God and to honor your family and do Salat al Rahim, but your people, your, you know, Kaumuka uh, Haleku, um, uh, uh, right? So your people are um, are in ruin, like your people are dying. Your Quraysh, the people, your relatives are dying of this famine. And then the prophet actually changes, and he he he, got, he prays to God to help the, them, right? Um, so there's this notion that you know you don't even with your enemies, you know you don't wish certain um, certain affliction upon them, right? Because uh, there's this kind of conception of your duty to them as as human beings, um, and in a, a, even with with property, you know I think that. Um, there's a great story in the Maghazi al Waqadi. I'd have to look at the reliability of the story, but uh, Maghazi al Waqadi, um, where after the Muslims conquered the city of Khaybar in the Hejaz, which was basically almost all Jewish population by that point, uh, they um, they find a lot of like re religious books, so written kind of Jewish texts. And they preserve them. And uh, later on, uh, the Jews come and the Prophet actually gives them these books, right? So there's this notion of like kind of respecting and preserving the, the scriptures of other communities, even if you don't agree with those scriptures or if you think that they're, um, they're, they're corrupted. Um, okay, well, uh, that was kind of what I wanted to discuss. And I guess I'm not sure if there's, uh, you know, like question, answer, or... How do I unshare this? Let me see here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Can you all see me? Okay. So that's, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I can't. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very interesting topic. Uh, uh, we have several questions, but uh, let me start with my question. Uh, how could we benefit nowadays uh, practically from the idea of Mithaq al-Madina or the Medina constitution? Especially we are living, like in the West, we have more liberal uh, political system, even the idea of a state, etc. This is like more... European idea about the state, it become later um, American idea, developed in, uh, in international relation and become more like implemented in the Muslim world. So how can we benefit it practically from Mithaq al-Madina? This is the first question. Uh, the second question is about uh, justice. Yes, I, I do believe uh, justice is one of the main things that we can benefit from uh, the Prophet Muhammad and the Islamic tradition. And we can see this also in many of the political Muslim thinker. Uh, they are discussing a lot about uh, social justice, political justice, uh, economical justice, etc. Uh, but also I would like to mention that we have also another idea which also we can benefit uh, from uh, it, which is the idea of Adab. Because the idea of Adab is what I shape fi makana, which is the, the proper, like, even the idea of justice is implemented in the idea of Adab. So it's like Adab is like more uh, bigger than justice. So uh, I would like, uh, if it's possible, that you can address this. Uh, this is the first round, then we can go with the, the question after that, more question. Um, yeah, I think that... Um I think that in some ways, uh, in a lot, I think in a lot of ways, the, the kind of Muslim conception of kind of liberal li liberty or uh, liberalness, liberalism, is um, more useful for today, right? So, um, like, and I've written about this in the past. Uh, if anyone's interested about it, uh, in it, but. 
Um, oh, look, my shirt's from Turkey. Just so that everybody knows I'm wearing a Turkish shirt from Mavi, my favorite shirt. Um, uh, you know, like, in the United States, for example, it's a, you know, as Americans like to say, it's a free country, right? Um, but in terms of, uh, there's a lot of areas of life which are very restrictive, uh, even in re in terms of religion. So, like, if you, um, you know, you're not allowed to have more than one wife in America, right? Uh, you're not allowed to, uh, things like um, who you can marry, uh, like marrying cousins, things like that. This is really restricted. Um, um, I mean... Sorry, it's like a little bit morbid, but like, for example, committing suicide is pr prohibited, right? So let's say somebody has a religious belief that they should kill themselves, you know. Um, there's a lot of aspects of religious life which are restricted. And then, of course, uh, in public education, and you can see the same thing in Britain, right? What students are, you see this already in Britain, and there's efforts to do this in the United States. The United States is a very decentralized educational system, so it's much slower. But there's a lot of efforts to, uh, for example, uh, inculcate certain ideas about gender and sexuality in even young children in the public school systems, which are completely unacceptable to, you know, uh, traditional Muslim, Christian, Jewish uh, understandings of gender and sexuality. So, uh, whereas, you know, in Islamic, in the Constitution of Medina and Islamic civilization in general, like, there was a real belief that if people, um, if people had a religious belief, they should be allowed to follow those religious beliefs, provided they're not harming others. And I think this is kind of ironic, because people often associate this, you know, what's usually called, like, the mill rule after John Stuart Mill, this idea of, you know, you can do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting others. Um, they really sort of they associate this with the, the West. But, in fact, I think that there's uh, the notion that, that oftentimes that, that rule is not really apply, not really followed in uh, Western understanding of religious liberty. And uh, whereas for Muslims, it was really understood, right? So, like, uh, if you the, when the British took over India, uh, they basically prohibited this practice called sati. Sati is a widow, Hindu widow, self-immolation, right? So a Hindu, especially Rajput's wife, uh, when her husband died, uh, if she was like a noble woman, like she would might want to burn herself on the, could basically die on her husband's funeral pyre. And um, the British prohibited this in 1829. They considered it to be barbaric. And when um, some, some Hindus pro pro protested, the British were like, well, we don't, basically, we don't care. This is barbaric. We're not going to allow it. And uh, the Muslims actually always allowed it, uh, but with one, on one condition, right, which is that they would, um, they would make sure that the woman wanted to do it. So the woman had to come ask permission from the Muslim governor or ruler, and then if she asked permission and she really wanted to do it, then they would let her do it, right? Um, and the second point on adab is, I think, also very important, and I think this is almost more useful today, which is that adab applies regardless of whether you like someone or not. So uh, I think especially politics in America today, and I, I don't know about Europe, but certainly the United States, is it's so uh, absolute, right? And it, it you know, you're, you're, you're always supposed to be kind of this walking embodiment of your beliefs and of your, your sentiments, right? So, uh, you know, oh, how dare you shake hands with this person? How dare you be on the same platform with this person? You know, how dare you be in this photograph with this person? How dare you sort of speak to them politely? You know, if, if, they, if they have this bad belief, you should never talk to them. You should never be around them. You should totally dismiss them and shun them. Um, uh, that's not how uh, Muslims are taught to act with one another, or even with their opponents, right? So you're always, um, you always, there's always a minimum adab with your uh, your um, your fellow Muslims, even if you disagree with them. And there's a famous hadith about this, you know, in the Sunnah of a Tabarani, in Mojim of a Tabarani, about um, the different neighbors, right? So your neighbor who's a Muslim. And and who's your relative has like three hucks. Like you have the 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 of being a Muslim, the hukk of being your relative, the hukk of being your neighbor. 
And the, the, the neighbor who is um, a, a Muslim and their neighbor, they have the haqqa being a Muslim and the haqqa being a neighbor. And then the neighbor who's not Muslim and who's not your relative, they still have the, this haqq of being your neighbor. And that means you have to uh, give them money if they ask for it. You have to congratulate them if something good happens. You have to give them condolences if something bad happens. You have to um, offer them food. You can't cook food uh, without offering some of it to them. I mean, so that's all people who are not even, who are not Muslim. So this idea of, you know, that there's certain duties that we all have to one another, regardless of whether we agree with one another, this is, I think, very important. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now we have a lot of the question. Let's may, maybe take two two. Uh, the first question is uh, someone asking about, uh, please elaborate more on uh, equity in relationship to gender, keeping in mind that uh, this idea is more Western concept of gender. The, the idea of gender is Western, so how you can relate this to equality in Islam. The second question is about uh, religious freedom. Uh, someone is asking about, uh, this is like what you are explaining about uh, religious freedom, uh, but uh, he asks, uh, did the Prophet, uh, did not the Prophet break the, the, the Asnam in Quraysh and Omar also, uh, uh, ban the fire uh, worship in uh, Persia? And also we have another question about uh, if it's possible that you, ca you could please elaborate on the Islamic conception of a humanitarian international law, the Sira, in relationship to international relation uh, and nation and the global affairs. Yeah, um, so I think uh, this religious liberty, I don't think that Omar bin al-Khattab uh, banned fire worship in Persia, because I mean, the fire Zoroastrianism continued until today in Persia. Like until I've been to Yazd in Iran, and they have fire temples there. So, um, in fact, the they did not even um, force the divorce of Zoroastrians who were married with like brother sister marriage. The, the Zoroastrians had this tradition. Uh, until the 1300s, it was probably not very common, but it, it happened, um, where you have like brother, sister, even father, daughter, or mother, son marriages. And um, the, uh, there's a, a companion, Al-Ta'a al-Hadrami, is sent uh, to Zoroastrian communities, and he affirms this uh, practice. Um, uh, And there, there's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari where it says that Omar commanded that these marriages get broken up, but uh, there's no actual um, real evidence that he did that. And the, the, the medhabs in general uh, affirm these marriages. Uh, Muslims don't have anything to do with them. Like, Muslims aren't going to, like, it's just not, Muslims will not, not touch those people. They can do what they want, but Muslims aren't going to have anything to do with them. But they're allowed to practice that under Islamic law. Under Muslim rule, um, uh, and why? So yeah, the Prophet alayhi uh, salam broke the, the idols in and around the Kaaba, right? But that's because that's the Beit Allah Latif, right? This is the actual house that Abraham, the Prophet Ibrahim uh, alayhi salam, built for the worship of the one God. Like that's you can't have idols there. Um, but I mean, Muslims didn't prohibit idol worship under their rule, um, whether even uh, in India, for example, they didn't uh, prohibit idol worship. In fact, sometimes the Muslim dynasties would uh, sponsor or give aid to um, Hindu temples where there were idols. Because uh, they, were, they were treated like people of the book. Um, uh, then on gender, uh, so, yeah, I mean, like, I, I, you know, this notion of gender is a complicated one, but I mean, we can uh, avoid that by just saying kind of biological sex. So the notion of biological sex is definitely not a Western concept. Uh, it's a, an everybody concept, right? So, uh, and Islam clearly has the understanding that there, you know, there, um, there's male and females. Um, and you might have people who are ambiguous, like uh, al muhannath uh, or al muhannathun right? So, kind of Afri uh, hermaphrodites um, 
but even those people who are muhannathun like you have to put them in one category or the other right so just if you have to see like is this person muhannath okay are they really a man or really a woman so you no matter uh, what uh, people have to be put into either male or female category um uh even to the point where if someone is like uh, and, and this is more like a theoretical question it's not something that really happens i don't think but if you have someone who's what's called uh mushkil, where you have someone who is um like uh, they have no sexual markings like they have no gender like a completely androgynous being as an adult then you would you would just go by what they're attracted to so if they're attracted to men then you put them in the woman category if they're attracted to women you put them in the men category um yeah so uh, i think that um that's a pretty clear concept um and again uh you know there are rights and obligations that are specific to men there are rights and obligations that are specific to women but the kind of the default is that or the kind of uh, the, the the presumption or the also is that you know men and women are dealt with in the same way as human beings unless you have some reason to you know treat them differently right so this is uh, a kind of a, a hermeneutic principle that muslim scholars have when they're deriving law and theology right which i mean and you see this over and over again and and you know, just open up any book of hadith for example hadith commentary um, that you know any hadith that talks about men or talks about women the assumption is that it's it's true for the other sex as well so if the prophet says you know um uh, or something like you know any red man who does this or something like that uh it also applies to women except in, unless there's unless there's an indication that it would not so the assumption is that what's said about one gender applies to the other gender as well unless there's some reason not to um okay What about the, the question about the humanitarian international law? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Muslims have a very developed tradition of um, of kind of laws of war, both what it allows engaging in conflict and then how to act in conflict. Um, and I think it, it's, it's, def it's sort of comparable to... Um, uh, comparable to... Uh, to kind of modern or late 19th and early 20th century uh, European um, notions of international humanitarian law. Uh, in fact, there's this book, I'm trying to remember the, uh, I think it's by a guy named Will Smiley. Uh, let me see. I think it's called From Slaves to Prisoners of War. Um, let me just check from it's a really interesting book uh yeah from slaves to prisoner of war by will smiley it just came out i think last year um a great book about ottoman laws of war so what, what's really interesting is so the ottomans through the 1700s and 1800s are this like kind of ongoing war with the russian empire and uh you know at first like you know, both sides, they capture, if they, you know, the Russians capture Ottomans, the Ottomans capture ultra people, they kind of take them as slaves. Uh, sometimes they use them in the gal in, as galley slaves, or they just, you know, take them as slaves in general on both sides. And then uh, they're sort of fighting these wars so often that they kind of, instead of, you know, because they, when they'll, they'll, they'll fight, and let's say one side wins one time, another side wins another time, they'll, they'll, like, the victor will kind of demand the return of those prisoners. And so they, they, these two, both sides kind of realize that this is happening so much that it's better just to not kind of enslave and integrate these people into society. We basically just keep them like almost in camps um, or in certain places and then just return them when the next kind of round of fighting happens. And so uh, through the early 1800s, these, the, the Russians and the Ottomans kind of developed these conventions for treatment for prisoners and then uh, kind of return of prisoners after the cessation of conflict and uh, so when the uh, first kind of international accords are being signed in the late 18 in the late in the kind of in the 1890s and then uh, the early 20th century 
uh, the Ottoman uh, government is basically like, yeah, we actually already have these conventions. We've been using them already with, we developed them on our own with uh, the Russians. So I think that's a really good example of um, kind of modern uh, international humanitarian law that's developed kind of indigenously by Muslims. Okay. So... Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have more two questions. Uh, the first is, how can we reach to economic justice uh, on the national and global level based on the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad The second question is, what is Islam or the Prophet Muhammad teaching us about uh, standing against injustice? So, uh, it's more clear what about justice, etc. But uh, how can we, when we see injustice, especially for example, political injustice, what is Islam or the Prophet Muhammad teaching us about uh, standing against uh, political injustice, economic injustice, etc.? Um. Boy. Yeah, I don't know the answer to the first one. I mean, that's, that's above my pay grade. Uh, um, I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think one big difference is that, um, You know, from a Muslim point of view, an Islamic point of view, like there's no, there's no point in massive accumulation of wealth for the, for wealth's sake, right? Um, you know, if you think about how rich the richest people in the world are, like there's no reason why someone needs to have that much money, um, and uh, and uh, you know, I mean that's. But I, I'm not sure. I don't really know how to answer that question. I, I, not that it's, it's a very good question. I just don't know the answer. Um, but not in any way that would be beyond what the kind of average Muslim would, would offer. Uh, in terms of standing up for injustice, uh, against injustice, right, we know this is a major obligation of Muslims. You know, one of Muslims' obligations is Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahi al-Munkar and the famous hadith, Man nur al-Munkar and fal-gayr bi yadihi wa man. When Lemmy sat out for the Lisan, he when he sat out and then hated in his heart, he, but that's the weakest of faith, right? So, um, you know, Muslims are even if you you have to speak up against injustice, and uh, if you can't speak up, then you should at least hate it in your heart. Um, so that that's part of a Muslim's obligation um, is to not allow injustice, never to do injustice to others. And then not to allow it to the best of one's ability. But of course, um, you know, people are limited in what they can do um, by fear of consequence. I mean, you know, we're, you know, we're not required to, you know, if, 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 if you know that you're going to get arrested and put in prison, if you say something bad about the ruler, then you're not, you know, you're not required to do that. Um, uh, so I, I think that, um, but but certainly that one should not be complicit in injustice. So, so you shouldn't do injustice to others, and you shouldn't be complicit in it. I think that's very important. I mean, uh, uh, you know, we if you just think about if we think about our daily lives, like how often do we lie? Do we cheat? Do we take things that aren't our that aren't ours? Do we exploit stuff like? You know, oh, I'm going to use my company's computer for this thing, which is actually not, I'm not allowed to do that. Or I'm going to get my cousin, I'm going to let my cousin use my company's computer. Uh, or I'm going to let my company, you know, I'm going to use my company discount for my cousin or something. Like that's not actually, you, you, that's not your money, right? That's not you, it's your company's money and your cousin isn't part of the company. So we all do this stuff without thinking about it, and we think it's a good thing to do. But uh, in fact, these, you know, there's lots of areas in which we uh, abuse others and take things that aren't ours. Um, and so, you know, even if we can't necessarily change great injustices around us, 
uh, we can at least not be perpetrators of injustice in our own lives. Okay, okay. Uh, we have also more a question here uh, about the concept of uh, Islamic concept of justice and other. Can we uh, use the idea of justice with the people who commit uh, injustice? So could we have adapt with the people who are who doesn't apply the adab in their behavior? Uh, also, we get another question. You mentioned women speaking up in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's always, I mean, the point about adab is that it sort of always applies, right? So you don't... Um, you know, and the best example of this is just the kind of the edib around ambassadors. So if your enemy sends, like, even if you're in a war, and your enemy sends, like, a representative to speak to you, you don't, like, hurt that person, right? Um, when the prophet meets uh, the representative of uh, Musaylim al-Kadhab, uh, he doesn't kill that person, right? He meets him outside of Medina, and he listens to his offer, and he says, no, I'm not going to... Um, you know, I'm not going to give this to you, right? Uh, when the, the Muslims send um, Uthman ibn Affan to Mecca during the, um, like around the time of Bayat al-Ridwan, right? So uh, he goes and he goes and discusses things with Mecca and he comes back, right? So, um, you know, you, you, if, if, you, if you can associate and discuss things with your actual enemy during war, then, you know, Mimbab al Aula or whatever, you know, a fortiori, right, you can, um, or a maniori, um, you can do that with people who you politically disagree with, right? Um, and also, you know, in, in, in Islam, like, you know, at least in Sunni Islam, right, do we believe in uh, so you, you can pray behind even sinful imam like even if this imam is unjust or awful or sinful if the imam leaves a prayer you you pray behind the imam right so um uh, and, and there's a great example of this in sahih bukhari uh where during the first civil war um you know after the the the, the, the assassination of ali ibn abi talib the um you know, these companions who were, used to be friends, right? I mean, they were all, they, they meet to discuss the war and to kind of try to have a, a discussion. Uh, and they're on the opposite sides of the war. So they're fighting, they're physical, but then they, the event happens and they all go and they pray in the same prayer. So this is important idea of like that um, even the most severe political disagreements uh, don't transcend people's identity as Muslims. Uh, and then the notion of women speaking up during the time of the Prophet, I mean, there's lots of examples of this. Uh, probably the most famous example is actually not during the time of the Prophet, but it's during the, the time of Omar ibn Khattab. And it's um, a story that you see in the, the Muslim of Abu Ya'la al Mausa. No, sorry, it's not in the Muslim, but it's, it's in the. Uh, Sharh Ma'ani al Athar of Tahawi, of Imam al Tahawi, where uh, Omar bin Khattab is giving the khutbah and a woman stands up in the middle of the khutbah and, and disagrees with what something he's saying. And not only does he not tell her to shut up and sit down, I mean, he, he listens to her and then he, he says, Oh, yeah, actually, you're correct. And he, so I mean, and this is considered to be Sahih report by Ibn Kathir and others. So this is a well known example. Um, and uh, in, in addition to others, which are one can also find. So uh, I think this is an important point that, you know, uh, women's voices were, were heard like the voices of men in, in public discussions. Okay, uh, another question also about the uh, situation, Corona, how can we benefit from the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad and uh, uh, benefit from this nowadays uh, in this difficult time? Yeah, um, 
It's actually an interesting question. I mean, we, we there's there's uh you know we know about these hadiths about um about the taun right. So if you if you're in a place where the prophet says if you're in a place where there's a plague, you know that you shouldn't uh you shouldn't leave or you shouldn't go there. So if there's a, if the the plague in a city, right? You shouldn't leave the city if you're there, and you shouldn't go there if you're not there. Uh, so that's important, right? So have uh, good advice. Um, and then there's uh, in uh, I just saw this the other day in the Tahbib al Athar of uh, Muhammad bin Jarir al Tabari, the famous historian, in his hadith massive hadith collection. I think only part of it has survived, but it's it's been published. Um, I think by uh, Ahmed Shakir um, in a number of maybe seven or eight volumes. Uh, he narrates from uh, a Zuhri from uh, um, well, a Zuhri via some intermediary from Omar uh, bin Khattab that uh, he says, "Can call the rajul and be on is this minni qaida ramhan?" Right. So. Uh, so the uh, the Omar says to the man who has some disease, uh, sit away from me. Sit uh, like the distance of a spear, a spear's length away from me. Um, and then there's another one which is, I think, uh, not very reliable, but it's still. Uh, I mean, in just in terms of, if we're going to be discussing this. So, in the Kenz al Amal of al Mutakal Hindi. There's a man who has um, uh, like uh, leprosy, uh, and the prophet said that uh, sit away from me like the distance of one or two lances. But this is probably uh, un, uh, made up hadith. There's Hashim. He wants to say hi. Salam alaikum. Say salam alaikum. Ya Hashim. Say salam alaikum. Okay, good. Yeah. We. You... Okay. Okay, so th there is also one question about uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, He was sent as a mercy uh, to the humanity So how should we uh, as a Muslim react to the argument that Islam is uh, spread by sword and by violence? I mean, I just react by saying it's not true. I mean, the Muslims don't spread Islam by the sword. Um, the m Muslims, yeah, Muslims conquered territory in the Middle East, but they didn't force anyone to become Muslim. At least, I mean, not in any, I mean, the examples you can find are just one or two examples of, like, individuals forcing someone else to become Muslim. But, I mean, it's, it's I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that places like, you know, Iraq in 800 is only 18% Muslim. Um, in 800, only like 15 or 10% of Andalusia is Muslim. Uh, places like Egypt, Iran, Iraq don't become majority Muslim until you know, the 1100s. Um, so, and even at the beginning of the 20th century, right, the, the majority, in like 1910, um, you know, like the Middle East is fourteen percent non-Muslim. So I mean, like Middle East, North Africa is like fourteen percent of the population is not Muslim. Egypt till today is like you know ten, fifteen percent of the population is Christian. So you know, the Muslims don't force people to convert to Islam by by force. Uh, it's just not accurate. Uh, okay, since it's Ramadan and we fasting now uh, nowadays, uh, so what are the, the lessons we learn from the Prophet Muhammad uh, relating to fasting, social solidarity, uh, having solidarity with the poor people, and also yeah. after uh, finishing Ramadan uh, or in the last day we, we need to pay the zakat al fitr. So uh, how can you relate this to social solidarity and how can we benefit uh, nowadays from uh, mm -hmm. this? Muslim ideas or Muslim ideas. I'm not sure. That's that's. Uh, I don't know enough about that issue. I'm, you know, I fast, but I don't know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I have to go because some stuff is happening. I need to go participate in. Um, so. Uh, 
it was very nice to talk to everybody and see you all, at least Fatty and Eunice's picture. Um, and uh, I hope that it was useful talk for everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. We are very happy always to have you. Uh, hopefully next time we will have you in the campus, not online. So that will drop. Yeah. It's all right. I miss Turkey. Yes. Turkey uh, miss also. <laughs> Uh, tomorrow we also will have uh, we will continue our uh, seminars and tomorrow uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, Jasser Oda, Professor Jasser Oda. Uh, Professor Jasser Oda was also visiting us several times in Siga and uh, it will be the same time, uh, 3.30 Istanbul time and it will be about Usul al-Fiqh uh, and uh, Maqasid al-Sharia and how uh, we know that Professor Jasser Oda is very distinguished professor uh, he wrote many books and uh, and uh, articles on Maqasid al-Sharia so we will be very uh, happy and honored tomorrow to, to, to have our next uh, lecture thank you very much and have a nice day